A warm welcome also from my side on behalf of the Cooperative Strategies Interest Group, who is hosting this session today, and a warm welcome to Jim Hall and Richard Therful for uh, joining us today in this session. Um, my special thanks also to Samir, who organized uh, today's speaker event, and I hope uh, that I will see you in our future events, which are hosted regularly um, as part of a dialogue between practitioners and academics to advance research and inspire researchers to tackle important issues in the field of strategy and cooperative strategies. Without further ado, Samir, please uh, take us uh, through the webinar. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Marvin, and uh, uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, I'd like to just start off by introducing our two esteemed panelists. Uh, Professor Jim Hall uh, is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineers. Uh, he's a professor of climate and environmental risks in the University of Oxford and director of research in the School of Geography and the Environment. Before joining the University of Oxford in 2011 to become director of the university's Environmental Change Institute, Professor Hall held academic positions in the Newcastle University and the University of Bristol. Uh, he is a member of the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology uh, and is an expert advisor to the National Infrastructure Commission. He was a member of the UK Independent Committee on Climate Change Adaptation from 2009 to 2019. Amongst various distinctions, Professor Hall was awarded the George Stephenson Medal from the Institution of Civil Engineers in 2001 and the Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Prize for Water in 2018. He was a contributing author to the Nobel Prize winning Fourth Assessment Report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He has published more than 160 articles in peer-reviewed journals, which have been cited more than 15,000 times, and is editor of the journal Water Resources Research. Professor Jim Hall, welcome to the panel, and thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I would like to also take this opportunity to introduce Richard Trefall. Richard is a partner and the global head of KPMG's impact at KPMG. He has over 20 years experience in infrastructure policy, governance, strategy, and financing, advising both the public and private sector clients in the UK and overseas. Richard began his career as a civil servant at the UK Department for Transport, where he held positions in the road, rail, and aviation directorates. Between 1996 and 98, he was private secretary to the Secretary of State for Transport and the Deputy Prime Minister. He subsequently moved to the infrastructure advisory team at Citigroup before joining KPMG. He has a particular interest in supporting the mobility revolution, promoting dialogue between the public and private sectors globally to maximize the social and economic benefits of autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and mobility as a service. He is a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers. He is a member of the Infrastructure Board of the Confederation of British Industry. He chairs the Advisory Council of the Infrastructure Forum and is a prolific writer on infrastructure and transport and is quoted regularly in the trade and national press. Thank you so much, Richard, for making time for us and welcome to the panel today. With that, I'd like to hand over to John to take it forward in terms of the discussions with the panelists. Thanks a lot, Samir. So, um... Thank you everyone for joining us and again thanks to Jim and, uh, and Richard for, for being our experts here. So uh, the, way, the way this is going to work is um, we've got three key questions uh, that we're going to pose to, to Richard and Jim uh, and they're going to give us each give us their opinion um, on these questions and each one will be around 15 minutes each. So hopefully we'll have some nice dialogue uh, and then we'll wrap things up at the end. Questions from uh, the audience and maybe a few questions from us. So, let me kick off with the first question. Um, so if we think about you know, climate change, we all know it's an urgent and emergent phenomenon in some ways, um, but we're still seeing a reluctance and collaboration between different actors, maybe along the supply chain and across different industries to drive this change faster. Uh, so we'd like to ask you, why do you think we see this? Why do we have this reluctance and how can we change this? What are some of the tensions that you observe from an industry perspective and, and from an academic perspective. So um, let's kick this off with Richard first. John, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, and, it's, and it's wonderful to be able to be part of this conversation with, uh, with, with Jim, who I've known for, for many years. And we've, we've had these exchanges across more private forums than this one. So it's rather nice to bring it into a more, a more public uh, arena. Um, 
Um, first, you 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 started by saying this is this is an urgent matter, John, and I and I guess I just want to land. I still don't think people realise just how urgent it is. Uh, we passed this week the point at which uh, the carbon clock forecast is that we are now uh, under six years, um, sorry, under seven years before we reach the point at which the global warming of the world is a one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And, and one and a half degrees doesn't sound very much, does it? But I think probably most of those who've, who've joined this conversation will recognise that actually it's a really serious matter to go over one and a half degrees because we start to get into the territory where humanity may well lose control of the ability to uh, control the, you know, the escalating effects of climate change and, and we end up in a uncharted territories. So so I think it is really serious. And I think it's it's really good that I've observed over the last year in particular our corporate clients with whom we engage at kpmg really waking up to climate change being a serious issue it's now a top board issue for nearly every major company in the world but i don't think that sense of real urgency is there now to come to the specific of your question i i'm actually not sure that there is a reluctance within industries within supply chains and with ecosystems of industries to grip this collectively. I don't think there's a reluctance. I think my, my, my hypothesis is that we are missing the two things that those ecosystems need in order to be able to collaborate effectively. Um, firstly, I think we are missing the governance. M largely, we have established the corporate environment over the last hundred years, maybe even two hundred years, maybe since the Industrial Revolution, where competition really reigns over collaboration, and that's even enshrined in you know the way in which many governments try to restrict um, the collaboration that takes place between companies because it's considered the best interest of consumers is a competition. So, so in many cases, the structures in order to um, provide collaboration between industries within the same sector just don't exist or are not mature enough to exist. So that's hypothesis one. And hypothesis two is that even where some of that collaboration has started to take place, there isn't really the yet the aggregation of data and the analytics of data at an aggregated ecosystem level that allows those players to be able to um, understand how they minimise their, their, in particular, their carbon impact collectively between them. Now, we're making huge progress in that space. Um, and perhaps if we come back to this, I'd like to hand over and give Jim some, some, some chance to come into this. But um, I mean, we've done some really interesting things over the last year with, with certain industry groups, for example, with the sugar beet industry in Australia, where they have collaborated and where data has been captured on a platform in a transparent way that everyone can see what's going on. But maybe I'll just leave it there for the moment and, 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 and let Jim come into the conversation too. Yeah, well, let me jump um, right in, and um, I should also say what a pleasure it's it's to be here um, and to be having this conversation. There is a a bit of a, a risk this afternoon that Richard and I um, violently agree with each other in a um, fairly um, repetitive way, um, and. Uh, to my starting point, um, both around urgency um, and specifically in relation to the question um, challenging this framing in terms of reluctance um, is aligned, though my two further points, I, I think, flesh things out in slightly different directions. But um, in terms of the, the, the question saying, well, that the, maybe there is some reluctance to see collaboration I don't think that's the case. I, I agree with Richard on that, that um, I think there's there's a very strong sense of motivation um, within business, within um, academia, which is where I'm located, um, also within governments um, in, in most places around the world, um, are all um, motivated in the same direction now, I think. Um, but we're not seeing action fast enough because there are a number of um, very significant residual barriers. Um, and I would characterize the two 
most important barriers being um, uh, complexity stroke coordination issues um, and um, incentives issues. Um, and if we talk, sort those two things out, then we will get action on a much faster pace. Uh, the, the coordination problem it is a, a really tricky one because it, we're talking about a systems problem. Um, and uh, I mean, I do get a, a bit frustrated these days about people uttering the mantra of systems um, in, in a fairly uh, casual and repetitive way. Um, and so I, I kind of actually, though I've worked on systems all my life, I, um, I try and push back as often as I can and say, well, actually, can we carve this one up into a series of sub problems, which are reasonably self contained, and establish some targets for each of those silos, and do as best we can to solve this thing in silos, because if we can, it's just simpler. Um, but there are certain things in relation to net zero, um, which literally you cannot. Um, and so I think, for example, one can't make the case for hydrogen if you deal with it in silos. Um, and uh, hydrogen only works if it's a way of decarbonizing heavy industries, um, uh, steel, cement, whilst noting also that it's a, um, a feedstock for, um, for uh, uh, fertilizers, which don't emit in their production in the way that the Harbour Bosch does, um, but also decarbonizing heavier forms of transport and as a, uh, a storage fuel for um, dispatchable electricity via hydrogen turbines. Um, none of those things I think are going to make sense on their own. If you put them together, um, you've probably got a decent case for hydrogen. Another one would be around um, community heating, um, that unless you get builders, local authorities, planners, developers um, thinking together, um, you're not going to make the most of all the waste heat which is being created in lots of cities um, around the world and has ended up um, going into the atmosphere. So from time to time, there are coordination problems. And I think the coordination problems also exist in the realm that we're talking about in terms of how do you get many actors? Just how, how do you solve the information barriers um, which people need to know what other people are up to and what they're doing and what the opportunities are? Um, so that's one thing, and then and then the other thing is 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 around incentives, and um, we we could go on for a very long time about this if we sort out the incentives things, for example, in the way economists would like us to do with the carbon tax, um, but uh, maybe in some second best ways in relation to um, regulation and financial disclosure and so on, um, if we get more aligned incentives, which means that value cascades to the innovators, to the actors in this system who are, who are trying to do something. If they can see some return for the good things they're trying to do, um, then they'll be more ready to work together and accelerate solutions. Okay, thanks, Richard. Do you, uh, do you want to come back to anything that Jim said or, or continue? Well, I, uh, uh, Jim's already said we're going to risk boring the audience by <laughs> agreeing agreeing violently. Uh, but the incentives in this is 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 clearly key, and and of course it's not just about um, adding incentives uh, like carbon taxes. It's also about removing the negative incentives that sit in many industries that that actually encourage or subsidise the the use of sort of fossil fuel um, and carbon intensive approaches. So. It's, uh, it's an absolutely key point. Okay, thanks. Let me just push on this point a little bit then, because um, you know, in terms of incentives uh, and coordination, but maybe incentives specifically, both of you, what you were talking about was these kind of incentives almost from the government, right? So is there going to be a carbon tax or is there going to be something else that basically from the outside that incentivizes firms to work in, in a particular way? But 
you know, of course, in academia, you know, we study a lot about incentives within the organization and how to solve coordination problems, how to deal with information barriers. So do you have any particular thoughts on how we can push incentives within organizations, uh, you know, to improve on certain, certain, you know, climate change metrics to achieve carbon neutrality by a certain date? Or is it something that is basically driven by external factors? Well, I think I think there's both a. Um, I mean, I think the, the the piece around the role of government and and the position that government takes is is fundamental, and we might we might come back to that in 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 in, in a bit more detail in in a moment. But there's there's a massive role of government, obviously, as a regulator, but there's also a massive role of government as a procurer and buyer. Of services, which in most you know societies is 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 very very significant, um, and and there is and there is the role of government as a, as, a, as a legislator. So so there's lots of different ways in which government can 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 shift the position uh, for companies. Um, uh, but I guess what's interesting is government's not the sole determinant of the incentive on on businesses. Uh, and I guess I would call out the the other two that I think we've been seeing, in a sense, perhaps coming to bear more quickly in many cases than than government action over the last couple of years. Uh, the first one is the the incentive through uh, private finance. Um, uh, we are, you know, we were in a position a couple of years ago um, where the conversation around let's call it impact investing the the proposition if you like in the market was that you would somehow take a lower return in order to do good but you should do that for a proportion of your portfolio um, and we've completely moved beyond that now i think it's i think it's now pretty much um universally accepted that we're heading into a world in which the most sustainable investments are also going to be the ones that hold the higher returns. Um, and of course, the extreme version of that is that investments in assets which are seen as being very significantly carbon emitting, you know, sectors like, let's say, coal fire power generation, um, the risk for investors now is those become stranded assets and that people lose a lot of money on them. So, so, so um, we are, we are, I think, already in a world where companies that are um, evidently sustainable in their activity are both able to access money more easily um, and and at a better rate than they than, than than if they were not sustainable. So that that clearly is a very significant incentive on businesses. Um, and the other the other uh, incentive is around the behaviour of individuals interacting with those businesses, whether that's as a consumer uh, or as a potential or an actual employee within the organization. And I'd say that we've seen quite a significant shift, particularly in, um, I mean, just talking from the perspective of KPMG, it is remarkable the extent to which as we try to uh, you know, engage with whether it's at a university uh, level with university students coming to join us for the first time or whether it's for those that are further on in their careers. Um, a, a being able to explain how we see our purpose as a business and and articulating that purpose in the context of doing good for planet and society is a very, very high priority for a very, very significant proportion of individuals um, who express an interest in coming to work for us. And I don't think that's unique to us. I think this is becoming prevalent across across all industries. So, so that force is very significant on, on companies as well, um, which is what sometimes leads me to the slightly bold statement, which is I think that businesses that don't get a grip on this agenda and don't really believe in it will be out of business in the next decade because ultimately they won't be able to get the money and they won't be able to get the people and they won't be able to sell their goods. Do you have any thoughts? If I might just jump back on, um, on one of those points, um, which was Richard's assertion around sustainable investments. Um, of course, the, the hiatus we're seeing um, 
in particular in gas prices at the moment, um, will be held up as the counter argument to that. Um, and of course, this was due um, for the most part for uh, uh, an un unpredictable um, geopolitical shock. Um, though I think um, people who subscribe to portfolio theory um, would say that, well, shocks of one form or another are going to uh, happen inevitably. And so in that case, I'm always better with a more diverse portfolio. Um, and so I, I think we, um, and yet on the other hand, um, things have been particularly um, disturbing for sustainable investors um, uh, because um, kind of more or less by default, what it meant was their funds loaded up on tech, um, which was absolutely fine um, up until uh, this year. Um, and now that has bombed as well. So you've had a flipping between tech and oil and gas, um, which means that this year, sustainable investments haven't looked all that clever at all. Um, so, I mean, I'm when one looks at the, um, the prices of uh, renewable energy, what recently happened in the latest round of auctions um, for uh, electricity supply in, in, in the UK, um, with a, another drop right across the piece, including in um, floating offshore, um, then I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the direction of travel, the sustainable will be cheaper, um, but we've just got to be a little bit awake to what has happened recently because that argument is going to take some battering. Yeah, so, the, so, so I, obviously I agree with that. Um, and 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 you know if you want to be uh, you know perhaps cynical about consumer behaviour, then you say until the price is at least equal and the convenience is at least as good, then many consumers won't be able to or won't choose won't choose to to switch. Um, but but I'm also in a sense I'm also quite I actually think what's happened. Uh, courtesy of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and and the shock that it's put through the energy market, the added shock it's put through the energy market, um, in, the, in, 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 in the medium term, can only boost the case for renewable energy. Um, and, um, and, that's, uh, and that's not so much because of a volume and price point, although that's also true, but also because we're moving into a world where a lot of these um, more sustainable solutions um, are also more disaggregated and local. Uh, and so trying to deal with that sort of energy trilemma, uh, one com key component is, uh, is obviously the security of supply. Arguably, you've got much better security of supply if you've got a much more diverse set of wind farms, solar panels, um, you know, perhaps backed up by nuclear hydrogen storage, you name it, you know, a much more disaggregated uh, energy uh, generation to, to to delivery of supply um, is fundamentally going to be um, unlock the world from from where it's been gripped for more than you know sixty years now in this reliance on you know a relatively small number of uh, oil exporting countries. If I might, John, just jump back to your um, your your question, um, which was to do with incentives within organizations. Um, and uh, I, Richard has referred to, to the, the way some of these things um, work and why um, they, they matter. They matter from an investor perspective. They matter from a, a recruitment perspective. I, I really recognize that. Um, and uh, it, uh, even though, uh, I mean, we say within the University of Oxford, which has an ambitious sustainability strategy um, to um, uh, the way in which Oxford is, is going to make the greatest difference is through its research and education, not through how it heats its buildings, but nonetheless, having an overarching sustainability strategy, which contains ambitious commitments with respect to our estate and our business functions and travel, including 
um, travel by academics and in international students um, uh, is all part of the same story. So all of that, the signals you provide within an organization and the way in which you kind of seriously trying to address potential areas of hypocrisy, um, it actually it does matter. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so let's move on to, I wanna push the, the conversation more now towards um, academia, right? So. You, you guys are, have set the stage really well in explaining the phenomenon, the issues, the challenges, and some of the potential um, solutions from a policy perspective um, and a behavioral perspective. But now, us as academics, how can we help? How can academia be pulled into center stage here? Because Richard, you spoke uh, at the beginning about you know, ecosystems and issues around the governance of relationships and competition sometimes you know reigning over uh, collaboration uh, which can present a barrier to the progress and, and Jim you, you yourself have talked about you know this complexity and systems problems and things so as academics how can how can we help practitioners so there's a question for you Jim first and then Richard uh, from a practitioner perspective if, if academics actually help or, or get in the way <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I, I, I'm an academic, so I, um, I, I'm perfectly happy to point out all of the, the great things that academics um, have done and could do. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I think um, climate change is um, quite a remarkable example um, of a phenomenon um, where uh, which has been utterly science-led. Now, um, it's had some pretty kind of bumpy episodes on that ride. I think um, uh, it possibly took academic scientists um, longer to realise um, how the media, how communication and how politics works um, in a post-truth world um, than it should have done. Um, and some of that um, has also been quite misinterpreted. Uh, for example, I think I find the calls to, um, to the follow the science in terms of what we should do about climate change um, uh, are just conceptually wrong um, because deciding what to do is, is a value judgment. We need to trade off things we care about um, rather than it's not an empirical thing um, that, so we can't apply, appeal to science there but science has done a, a remarkable job in uh, highlighting and predicting this issue and predicting it in ways that even based on um, relatively small research groups um, and very simple models have um, 30, 40 years later, um, proved to be um, alarmingly accurate um, in terms of that, um, those um, 1.2 degrees of, of warming would being, um, could have been predicted 30 years ago. So, um, I mean, that's where we started with science. Of course, where um, academia now has a role is extraordinarily broad and interdisciplinary in terms of um, uh, the economics of climate change, um, how that plays into government policy and regulation, and then how it, it plays into the uh, to the roles of the private sector um, and civil society in, in addressing this problem. Um, and uh, it, it, there's plenty of academic work, um, as you know, looking at these questions we're examining today, which is, is what's the role of, of business in addressing this problem. Richard? So, um, so clearly, as, as Jim, Jim says, the, the science uh, has, uh, you know, has, has, has been the fundamental driver eventually of the changing recognition and, and, and behavior. Um, it feels to me like we're now in a phase where the big challenge is how do we actually create the implementation 
So if there is a broad, let's say, acceptance that a recognition of the severity of the of, of the challenge we're facing, um, it's now about what do we need to do and how do we make it happen? And in fact, I read an interesting piece just this morning um, that was by one of the um, uh, sort of consultants, the analyst companies had put out, which was saying that there was a marked difference between the percentage of um, senior executives, chief executives and, and board members who were saying that uh, their business was going to take action uh, in order to decarbonize um, from sort of middle management. Um, and they were and they were noting that this was different, for example, when, than, than digital transformation, where there tends to be an equivalence of answer. And they were surmising that um, that there was uh, because of the sheer complexity that Jim has referred to, that that it, particularly in big organizations, there was a, a real struggle of leadership to find a way of driving the intent down into action in the organization, as a result of which in the middle of the organizations, there's already a degree of cynicism as to whether what's being said at the top is actually going to happen. Um, and, and they didn't think this was greenwashing. In other words, it wasn't just saying that they wanted to do it without any intention of doing it. They actually had the intention at a, ma- at a senior management level of wanting to make change, but they were really, really struggling in how, terms of how to do it. Um, so to come back to your question about academia, then I think one of the you know, pressing questions at the moment is how can, what, you know, what can academia do to, to bring insight to bear in, in, in that area? Um, and you know, I've had the uh, I've had the privilege of working alongside Jim and, and many other academics for for, for for many many years, and and it often feels to me like there is phenomenal insight, absolutely phenomenal insight, often phenomenal analytics, phenomenal handling of of, of data insights that takes place within academic environments. The the challenge is how does that get translated? into a language and a platform that makes it accessible for business communities um, and uh, business communities that you know tend to only absorb things if they're easily read on sort of four slides of PowerPoint and most of that in pictures you know <laughs> and, and it's it's so how how do we how do we bridge a world which is um you know, at the beginning, Samir, you introduced Jim by talking about, you know, the, the number of papers and the citations and all the rest of it, which is clearly the way in which the world of academia is viewed, but 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 carries, you know, not one jot in the world of business, which 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 almost never reads or would even know where to go to read any of that or have the time to know where to read it. So so and this then brings us back to the to, to this this critical co- concept of co- conversation about collaboration because it feels to me that the maybe I put it out there and Jim may have a view you may have a view maybe the 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 easiest way to bridge that gap is just to create more fora in which you physically bring members of academia in with members of government in with members of of industry ecosystems and just have that academic perspective at the table rather than simply try and re, you know, rewrite it into different formats and try and try and send it out. Yeah, if I uh, might jump back in. Um, uh, with a, a, I'll come on to a couple of kind of self-critical things about academia, ways in which I don't think academia is, is getting it right now. Um, but one kind of uh, opening point, which is more kind of observation about these interactions, is that um, addressing climate changes is one of these things where um, actually we know pretty much most of what needs to be done. Um, and so it's, it's a question of um, repeating oneself um, and, uh, and very much focusing on, on implementation. Um, and those are the sorts of things which um, academics are kind of reluctant to do, but there are plenty of other people in this world who are, um, who are very well equipped to, um, to look at implementation. Um, the, from a kind of self-critical perspective, um, 
I, I, I don't see an, enough in academia which um, kind of balances what I think is, is needed from an interdisciplinary perspective to actually push forward solutions at this point where we are in, in addressing the climate crisis. Um, I think there's, there's lots of um, uh, enthusiasm, possibly naivety about um, technological solutions. Um, some of them quite kind of um, low TRL things, which again, um, engineers and other scientists love working on, um, but realistically speaking, are they gonna be there in time and at scale? Um, and then uh, amongst the social sciences, um, a, uh, I think a, a bit of a reluctance to engage with some of what um, I think are, are basically big geopolitical issues driven by global elites, which is part of a big chunk of how deals are going to be done around fixing climate. And that kind of dynamic, um, I, I don't know why it is. Partly um, it's because there the just aren't very many people working on it. Um, uh, partly because, yeah, of the flavor within social sciences departments, they don't kind of much like the sound of that business schools are focused on other things, economics departments are obsessed with methodology. Um, so there's just um, not enough attention to what I think is actually going to fix this thing. That's, uh, that's a great point into what I'm going to say next. So um, given that we, we might have some doctoral students on this, uh, on this forum, and this is going to go out onto YouTube anyway, so doctoral students will have access. So let's have a scenario, Jim, where you have a, a keen doctoral student who comes to you and says, I'm interested in, in climate change, I'm interested in relationships and collaborations from a managerial perspective, and I wanna do some managerial relevant research. What should I do? And the first thing you say to them is, well, go and speak to Richard to understand the context. So Richard, what would you tell that, uh, that doctoral student who comes to you who wants to, do some impactful research. What would you say to that student before you send them back to, to Jim? Well, well, the for, first thing I'd say is they've made a very, very good decision because they they won't be out of a job for the rest of their career. Uh, <laughs> because this, I mean, this isn't this is this. I mean, this this whole topic is in the nicest possible way overwhelming us and institutions like us in terms of the demand from 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 businesses for answers. Uh, so so uh, I would encourage anybody <laughs> in, in any of your institutions uh, to to think about what they could that they could do, um, and then and then um, secondly, in terms of the approach, I, I think I mean we are entering into more and more as an organisation more and more direct partnerships with universities and with groups of students within universities to to tackle particular issues. So, for example. Um, and forgive me, Jim, because this is a rare, this is a reference to Cambridge, not Oxford. Um, but we've uh, we've 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 recently uh, reached an agreement with with Cambridge to to work with them uh, in the in the whole area um, of the future of work, and in particular mental well being um, and the way in which we think mental well being will play into the future of work. And we've structured that as a as a formal collaboration where uh, we are both relying on the development of the research that is being done by Cambridge in that space. Um, uh, but we're also putting, you know, our own perspectives into that work from the coal face of our, our work with organisations. And obviously there's other spin-off benefits in terms of being able to introduce um, those academics into real life scenarios that particular clients of ours are, are engaging with. So, so in terms of the approach, um, I would I would say that. And, and then in terms of the what, well, the world's your oyster at the moment in terms of the, the you know, the which particular areas um, someone could focus on. Uh, but if I was to pick just a few that I think are very, uh, very top of mind, 
Um, one is um, how we translate um, the relative clarity of the measurement of, of carbon impacts, how we carry that across into um, the broader area of nature um, and indeed then beyond nature into other areas of what are called ES and G. So that's a big area at the moment and it's not, it's by a long way far from cracked. Um, so methodologies, systems and approaches backed by empirical uh, application that guide businesses around how in practice they can transparently um, uh, um, measure those impacts uh, in a way that will then stand the scrutiny of a business like ours that's sent in to say that this is a true and fair view. That's an absolutely fundamental uh, area that, that needs a lot, lot more work done on it. Um, uh, another area um, that I think is 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 still needing uh, um, work done is around how to and Jim, I think you touched on this or at least um, obliquely referred to it much much earlier. There's a piece around the way in which data is handled within ecosystems, so that the data that is that needs to be shared and understood on a shared basis in order to achieve optimal outcomes from the ecosystem as a whole can be dealt with in that way, whilst at the same time protecting the, the privacy and the cybersecurity and the commercial confidentiality of data within that ecosystem. Um, and um, you know, at a macro level, a lot of progress has been made in that space, but, but we are still seeing lots of experiments, if you like, in terms of how to put that in practice, in particular industry ecosystems, so that all of the players get comfortable with the way that the data is being handled. Okay, on to you, Jim. Thanks, Richard. What advice so do you give to your doctoral students? Yeah, um, I, to start with, um, one would begin by um, asking why someone wants to do a PhD. I think um, there's no point asking um, why they want to save the world. That's absolutely um, uh, fine and um, uh, and we're, we're not going to argue with that. Um, but uh, I think we, we need to be clear that um, doing a PhD is not going to save the world, but it will um, equip you in, um, in a whole series of ways which will put you in a much stronger position, in particular in terms of coming up with um, original solutions, and um, I mean, I was a little bit disparaging about the obsession with methodology and economics department, but it will te teach you rigorous methodology. Um, and at least within my research group, a, a lot of that is around um, analysis of systems, simulation, data analysis, um, modeling, scenario analysis, uncertainty and decision making. And those are all um, kind of incredibly generic and powerful methodologies, which um, uh, right across the climate domain and all sorts of other domains. Um, if you have expertise in those, um, you're, you're gonna be very well equipped. Um, and then in, in the meantime, um, provided you recognize that the, the problem you're gonna work on is, is going to be narrow and tightly defined, albeit within a broad and important context, then it may be that some of what you actually work on um, will make a, a small contribution to a, addressing the climate issue. Um, and um, again, if, if you're working in, in, in my research group, you'll, and also in, in so many parts of universities now, because we have a lot of focus on impact, on um, ensuring that research does make a difference in the world. Um, you'll learn, and perhaps we'll come on to this in, in the questions in a moment, you'll learn uh, a bit about how one thinks strategically about research having impact and um, 
builds the networks, thinks ahead, orientate what you do in ways that it maximizes the likelihood of that impact actually materializing. Okay, thanks for those insights, uh, Jim and Richard. Uh, so I have a question from, uh, from the audience, from Denisa Mangruta. Uh, and Denisa uh, is a colleague of mine. Um, she says that um, uh, one of the most difficult issues that we face in academia is that it's difficult to track down collaborations between firms or between firms and academia that have some kind of purpose, for example, uh, uh, carbon capture. It's also difficult to track down the outcomes of these collaborations. So it's all about kind of identifying collaborations and how successful those collaborations um, are. Do you have any tips on how we can track down these collaborations in, a, in an efficient way? Any databases, any, any insights? Well, one of, the, one of the places I would start is with the organizations who's in a sense who's raising detra is to is to establish those collaborations so i'm thinking for example uh of organizations um, that we're heavily involved with like the world business council for sustainable development um uh the world economic forum and the various councils that it runs um there are specific collaborations running today such as the task force on nature related financial disclosure uh the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, um, uh, and the Nature Conservancy, uh, organisations like that always have a running set of, of these sorts of things going on. And sometimes, uh, as with the WEF or the WBCSD, these are really business to business collaborations, so they may have academic components in them. Um, uh, some of them uh, are ones that, you know, draw, draw in more of them. Um, more of the sort of the activist and the third party community in as well. But um, that that would be where I would start. And certainly I've taken a view over the last couple of years that I've been leading uh, KPMG Impact, that it's really fundamental for us as an organisation to be in those sorts of uh, organisations and in those conversations, because I need the visibility of those collaborations and those conversations that are going on as well. Thanks. Jim, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure whether we should be thinking about um, collaboration as somehow being the goal or the, the end point of, uh, of academic research or indeed of, of, of other um, types of research. I, I mean, I, I, I mentioned briefly ideas around how to strategize about impact. And um, uh, from my perspective, a, that, that is to do with, um, with looking ahead, um, forecasting and horizon scanning uh, around future needs. What are, the, um, what are the questions and the emerging solutions on the horizon? Um, what organizations are going to be um, wishing to uh, adopt or promote, um, even if they haven't themselves fully understood that this thing is, is coming in their direction. Um, and then working proactively to um, identify the decision makers um, who you predict are going to be confronting that gap and orientating your research to fill that gap proactively. Um, just to give one example of that, um, I mean, I, I've worked on um, water resources in, uh, in Britain for a long time. So um, uh, uh, how we um, plan water infrastructure, in particular in relation to climate extremes, droughts. Um, in fact, I was doing a whole load of media this afternoon um, on what might happen with respect to droughts. And it was very clear, um, I mean, I would say even 15, possibly 20 years ago, that the way in which um, England was thinking about droughts, thinking about water resources planning was not um, in any way equal to the scale of threat that we face. It was being done 
at a water company level. It was not on a risk-based footing. It was based on fairly mechanistic planning. Um, and so one could just kind of look at that problem and say, right, well, at some point in the future, someone's going to wake up and recognize that they have to learn how to properly analyze risks and analyze systems at a much broader scale, at a national scale rather than the water company scale. So that's what um, we then, one of the things we've got our, our research program to do. Um, and then when that thing happened, actually, interestingly enough, um, uh, it was Rory Stewart when he was a DEFRA minister who first asked the question, what is the risk of drought in England? Or the first person to ask that question in a long time. Um, and that stimulated a whole load of action on the part of the Environment Agency and the other regulators in the water industry to get where we are now, which is this combination of a risk-based footing and a strategic national assessment, which happens, by the way, to be using a model I developed in my group. Um, so that, I mean, that, that's strategizing about impact. Um, the, the, the problem, the gap, the hook is the thing to focus on. The collaboration follows from that. Great, thanks very much for that <laughs> insight. We have a time for one question from, uh, from Samir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, um, you talked about incentives at the beginning of the program um, and uh, to induce businesses, um, which probably are driven by the market and are focused more on individual businesses uh, trying to drive a more sustainable business model for themselves, but probably carrying a few of the suppliers along. Uh, do you have you seen examples of incentives which apply or incentivize an entire industry group or an ecosystem, um, such as, for example, if you talk about the tech world, where you've got the Apple ecosystem or the Android and the Google ecosystem, and then you've got the entire innovation through apps and devices and the entire mm. industry which is spawned, and there's a market-driven incentive mechanism which allows people to collaborate. And there are successes and there are failures, but they're collaborating, they share information. Yep. And there are, of course, characteristics of such ecosystems, central leader, non-central leader, centralized, decentralized, we won't go into that. But for this entire incentive to move towards sustainable business, are you seeing incentives structures which are more aligned towards ecosystems or industry groups as a whole? Yes, yes. No, this is, this is really interesting. I, I alluded right at the beginning of this conversation to to work that we've done with the uh, with the sugar beet uh, industry in, in Australia. But let me take a slightly different example, one that's very dear to my heart, given all of my background in infrastructure and building and construction. Um, uh, you know, some of you on this on this uh, on this uh, uh, webinar may have uh, been aware of the terrible fire uh, in 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 London, the Grenfell fire. Of some years ago, due to the uh, due to the cladding on the side of the building uh, being highly inflammatory, and uh, and a lot of people lost their lives, and it still resonates as a sort of national scandal. Um, and and the key issue really was around um, the the lack of proper visibility of the application of standards. So it was not the standards were not there. It was that there was no way of, of really capturing whether everything that had gone into that building was to the standards it should have been and, th and therefore creating, um, if you like, a digital twin record um, that captured for everybody to be able to see that the thing had been done properly. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the New South Wales government um, has picked up on this um, and they publicly announced um, about a year ago now um, that they would they would work with KPMG to take a blockchain based platform and effectively seek for every single component supplier of the built environment industry to be to use that as a way of capturing all of the um, certifications and all of the standards and all the rest of it that had gone into anything that was that would would then be built. Um, um, and that's analogous to what we've done with the sugar beet industry, where effectively you, you've captured all that. Now, when we then you come to incentives. So 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 my um, optimistic belief, if you like, is that as we create these 
industry-wide platforms that aggregate all of the supply information that you need around a particular thing into that platform. You also have a choice around the level of visibility, the external, the public public visibility, the visibility to regulatory authorities and government of what's in there. Um, and that starts to create a positive incentive on businesses because you, in order to be part of that ecosystem, in order to play, it's like a license to play, you then have to comply and you have to be transparent and you probably need various things that you're doing to be then um, uh, assured by an organisation like a KPMG and so on and so on. So that to me is where where we are seeing increasing number of industries moving. But, you know, the, the data scale um, needed in order to do that across entire supply chains across the whole world is huge. So it'll be a little bit of a while yet before we see it land completely. So in view of the time, I think uh, we're now nearing the end of our webinar. I would like to take that opportunity to thank our speakers, Jim and Richard, for this really insightful dialogue. And of course, John and Samir for leading these questions. It was a pleasure listening to you. And if I uh, may summarize the key insights that I took away is um, that we agree that climate change is one of the most salient and uh, pressing issues of our time. And as Jim said, the question is not really what needs to be done. We have a fairly clear uh, vision of that, but how, rather how we can orchestrate the implementation process. And you mentioned issues such as incentives, coordination, and governance. And, and these are really issues that are at the heart of um, what management scholars also study at different levels of analysis. So we mentioned also the locus of action can be with the individuals, with organizations and governance, governments. And all of this needs to come together to really push uh, action forward for firms, um, but also for individuals and at the government level. So I think uh, this dialogue uh, was an insightful perspective into the complexity of the topic. And uh, I hope we could inspire uh, researchers and doctoral students to take on this challenge and research it to uh, foster new solutions and uh, better our understanding of this topic. Thank you from uh, my side. Uh, thank you also, Ryan, for supporting us again uh, on, uh, from the SMS office. And I hope to see you uh, in our future seminar series, which we will share um, via the channels. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. been a pleasure. Bye, everyone.